start from the beginning. I'm Ralph Magioni, and I'm born and raised in Savannah. Uh, going back in the family history, my great-grandfather was born in 1848. I was born in 1948. He was a member of a larger family that, you know, you, you're going to be a doctor, you're going to be a lawyer, you're going to be an Indian chief, and you're going to be a priest. Well, that was Luigi Paolo Magioni, the guy that escaped. But it was customary at the time for you to travel a little bit before you uh, entered the seminary. So he hired on uh, a vessel that was coming to the United States and, and moved up to Cedar Key, Florida. Possibly that's where he met Natalie Bettolini, who was from Caslano, Switzerland. But sometime just before 1870, they moved to Savannah and opened a confectionery and started selling seafood. And as the company grew, they moved to a, what they call a, we call a fish house, and it was on Montgomery and Bay. It was catty cornered across from a Stamp and Stencil Company. Uh, they grew. Uh, my great grandfather died and left my great grandmother a widow. And she raised Joseph Onorato Magioni and Gilbert Philip Magioni, my great uncles. Uh, my grandfather, J.O. Magioni, uh, was the one who finished uh, bringing the company up to uh, 2,600 employees and up to 13 canneries. I'm Algernon Barn, the son of A.S. Barn and Son of Incorporated, Savannah, Georgia, a crab and oyster processing facility in Pinpoint. And my grandfather got his start from his father, great, uh, George Creighton Varn, who had a, an oyster business in Thunderbolt. And my grandfather worked around there until he was 12 and he quit school so he could work full time with his father. In 1926 he was able to lease a, some land from the Wiggins family. It was just, Cypress was cheap then and um, so they just threw up a wooden building and started processing oysters. And in 1929 he was able to uh, purchase the property on which he built the A.S. Varn and Son Incorporated, now the Pinpoint Heritage Museum. This is the oyster factory. This is where the oysters got processed. These are the stalls. And after the 50s, these platforms were installed. Now, um, there's a lot of water getting here. This was excruciatingly hard work. It was cold, cold, cold. The only form of heat were three pot belly stoves that lined the center of here. And uh, they were fueled with wood or coal. Yeah, well, you know, my name's Hanef Haynes. I'm, I'm a native of Pinpoint. I was born and raised here. Um, my family, uh, uh, early family, were once uh, enslaved on Osabo Island. And once they got to the community of what we call Pinpoint, um, they organized or they started a crabbing industry. Their livelihood, uh, they were agriculturalists on the island, so once they got here, they depended on the salt marsh, so they created a crabbing cannery um, up until the Great Depression, and uh, when the Great Depression set in, they lost all of their financial earnings, but uh, they kept the land. I still live on the lot today, uh, the estate, the Ben Bond estate. So I say they were conservationists, uh, uh, and they had a, uh, respect for the salt marsh because their livelihood depended on it. The way Thunderbolt got the name Thunderbolt, it was Walsall, and there was a bolt of lightning that hit a big rock down at the south end where Thunderbolt Marina is. 
And that's when it became the name, they named it Thunderbolt. My grandfather had the Austin and Turpin and Fish, and he had a place down on Bay Street. And he would unload the boats right at Thunderbolt and then ship the stuff down to Bay Street at the market. Then he, his, his son got into it, Louis G. Ambrose, which is my grandfather. And he got into the Austrian business and then he got into the shrimping business. And then his son came into the business, Henry Ambrose, which is my father. <clears throat> and he got in more into the shrimp business. And he got in building boats. He built five, five or six shrimp boats right there in Thunderbolt. The city market was a grand thing back in those days. My grandfather was at West Broad and Congress. My Uncle Frank was at Barnard and Congress. My Uncle Louie, who's my godfather, he's at West Broad and Minus. So each one of them had their own markets. And they were like the big kingpins, all three of them, uh, selling seafood all around town. My grandfather was probably did the most for a while and uh, until, until he got older. And they would bring in uh, fish back in those days was brought in by Railway Express. So they would get these things shipped in. They'd go down to the uh, Railway Express station and unload these and uh, come back, process them. He, he was good for sending stuff up the country. Now they had, Savannah back in those days was a smaller market and you had quite a few people here. So a lot of those were sent out of town. My grandfather had quite um, extensive business and co clients, customers, all the way up to New York City, including New York City. And he shipped uh, canned crab meat and oysters, canned oysters and live crabs. They would take uh, the old liquor barrels and they put ice on the bottom of the barrel. Of course, this, it leaked. I mean, it couldn't help that, but then they'd put a layer of crab, live crabs and then moss soaked in salt water and layered that on top of it. More ice, more crabs, more moss, all the way up to the top, and then finished it off with ice. And that's how they went by train all the way up to New York City. The, the Terrapin business actually started from my great-grandfather when he was the conductor on the Isle of Hope Savannah Railroad. He saw the Terrapin on the bank of the river as they crossed uh, into Isle of Hope and had heard that people could eat them. And he started uh, collecting the Terrapin. He bought the property at Isle of Hope from the Savannah Electric and Power Company that was at the end of the railroad track or the streetcar track at the time. Uh, it came across um, through um, Sandfly, came across the Herb River and uh, into Isle of Hope and that's where we would see the Terrapin, and also along the trail. Um, they started the pavilion, uh, started breeding the Terrapin, and he spoke to a lot of people, uh, and he actually became the expert on Diamondback Terrapin. But the Terrapin business actually kind of took off, and it's somewhat of a delicacy. We sold to restaurants in New York and Washington, D.C., and um, packed the live Terrapin up, and we also made soup. Uh, at the same time, we had an oyster factory and a crab factory and uh, produced uh, crab and oysters um, for the, the community. A lot of the labor came from Pinpoint, Georgia, which you know there was a um, cannery there as well. This was what they used to call Mr. Vaughn Bassinet for the women who had uh, younger children. This would be uh, where the younger children would uh, be placed in the bassinet. And uh, that would be up at the house. The house was located on another part of the property. When Clarence Thomas was a baby, his mother, Leola, used to pick crab for my grandfather. And but Clarence was a baby in a playpen and my grandfather heard um, Clarence crying, 
So he hollered down to Sammy or, or uh, Richard or Peter and uh, told Leola to go feed that baby. He was crying, crying. So she'd get up and go over next door and breastfeed Clarence and, and come on back to work. And I know that's true because Leola told me. I don't think Algie ever saw color. I don't think he still does. You know, he grew up being down there and then when he went in the river and worked for his dad, um, they were just people that he loved and cared about. He had an old woman out there, Miss Helen. They have her in the big picture of her in the museum. And he truly loved Miss Helen and her daughter, Buck. And um, she would tell him he was doing wrong and but do it lovingly. And I think that was where Algie really found unconditional love is in Miss Helen. Daddy, uh, I think he doubled the salary he told me when he, when he became the manager, okay? So now he's making $20 a week and he goes home one night and grandmother says, uh, Charlie said, you got a letter from the post office with a job offer for them. He has a paper route in the morning because it seemed like he worked at the post office later in the afternoon. So he's getting up, you know, a married man delivering papers to make ends meet here and he's working at the post office. So this goes on for a few years and the uh, war breaks out he goes overseas as a postal clerk. So he goes over, comes back after World War II, and now he's got a decision to make whether he will go in the seafood business, which all the family relatives and all are in. He knows the ins and the outs, and he's got retail in the back part of his mind, where a lot of these other ones were retail and wholesale. So he's going to decide to uh, open up a little place. In the Mid 30s to late 30s is when the company really started to expand. The depression was still hanging on. Uh, the food business was working fairly well because people had to eat, but it provided employment from one end of the spectrum and it provided capital from the other end of the spectrum. So we had, uh, at one time, there was nine documented vessels, which is a ship. And these uh, ships plied the waters between, uh, you know, Savannah and Charleston and, and the city of New York. And we had canneries in Young's Island and in, in Megat, South Carolina. They were all up and down the coast, even down in Fernandina, Florida, uh, operating. And they were producing, uh, you know, five million dollars in gross revenues per year. So it was, it provided a great influx of capital to the area. It provided employment. It provided food, you know, a lot of the necessities. This is when the company was uh, very robust and, it's, and it was in its heyday with that many employees. And it started, you know, there was a lot of reasons for the, I, don't know, I hate to say decline, but in the reduction of production. In the state of South Carolina, if you didn't have a King's Grant lease, which meant that you owned to the low water mark, if you didn't have the King's Grant lease, it, it belonged, your leases belonged to the state. So we were able to lease in the state of South Carolina oyster bottoms from the state. But in the state of Georgia, the people, there was so many, uh, the King's Grant leases were large, so when one guy would leave it to his six or eight children, you know, people had a lot of large families in those days, we would have to contract with each of those families and it would take a busload of attorneys to get all these contracts. So we just, the canneries, as they were blown down by hurricanes, uh, we didn't go back in because it was so difficult to get raw product. And, and the canneries were placed in the areas that there were a lot of oysters. When I was coming up as a kid, I can remember the boats coming in and they had shrimp piled on the decks. Uh, they had to be careful because coming out the pilot house, they would step on the on the shrimp they had so many. At that time, I mean, there were, there were more shrimp than you could, you could think of. And it is really a shame the way it's declined. You, you just, I mean, I mean, everybody back then was catching shrimp.
actually at one time I think that the crab and the oyster factory was probably larger than the terrapin business. But the terrapin business was actually what started everything. Um, the cost of a bowl of terrapin soup, even in 1968 in New York, was $5. And that was in 1968. Today's terms are probably $25 or $30. Um, so it was, it was pretty expensive. Yeah, the pavilion, we actually had a few other items, I guess, that were of note. The, uh, my grandfather, great-grandfather, actually had a, uh, a merry-go-round uh, in the pavilion area. He had some ostriches, had exotic birds, parrots, and whatnot for, for people to look at. It was more of a, just a place to go and, and kind of escape from uh, the day-to-day -day realities. The streetcar actually stopped right almost directly in front of where the pavilion was. So he had sort of a captured market. You stop the streetcar, everybody gets off, and what's the first thing they're going to do? They're going to walk into your business. So it was a pretty good uh, business plan. It lasted about 80 years. The uh, pavilion was torn down in 1968. Uh, I was 10 years old, and um, it was economically bad at the time, I guess. The terrapin were harder to get. Um, a lot of the environmental issues had changed. Um, there were more regulations about what you could get and what you couldn't take. Yeah, Daddy started in 46, so Mr. Vaughn was, he'd, he'd been in business long before that, but anyway, he was picking crabs, got a beautiful pick. He had all the people at Pinpoint, okay, and he would do uh, the crabs, the shrimp, the oysters, the fish, and he did a, a beautiful job. Uh, we'd get the crab meat from him, and he had these big boilers. That's the way we do stuff in Savannah, and it would put them into a big old pot the size of this table, maybe two or three hundred pounds, and they'd lower it by a chain into the boiling seasoned water. They'd, they'd pull it with this chain, they'd pull it up, let it drain, they'd lay these out on the table, and ladies would start picking. Now, um, <clears throat> once the crabs were cooked, they were brought in here, there were three or uh, four small picking tables, and there were one large table that was uh, the cleaning table, and the crabs would all be placed on that cleaning table and the women would come in that afternoon to clean the crabs and the crabs then would, uh, once the crabs were clean, they would be redistributed on the four small picking tables and covered completely in ice. Yeah, when I do tours with people, you know, they ask how long the work days were and um, the best way that I can explain it, the way that it was explained to me, they worked from camp to camp. They couldn't see when they came to work and they couldn't see when they were leaving. I mean, the conditions, you know, a pot belly, wood burning stove, and you know, you have 18 degree, 20 degree weather. And then if there's a north wind or east wind blowing or west wind blowing, it comes through the stalls and it blows right back up into those women's face. For the most part, you know, a lot of them probably died from emphysema or COPD or some type of respiratory diseases that they didn't even know that they had back in those days. My father invented a peeling machine. And we had that machine went on the boat and it would size the shrimp out and then it would come into the plant and it would peel kind of like what they call today an easy peel. The girls would just peel the shell off instead of using the knife like we did in the olden days. They'd have to peel the shrimp and then devein it. And we called the plant, we named it the soup plant. Because <laughs> we peeled and deveined the shrimp. And we could peel and devein 1,400 pounds of shrimp an hour. Watching the, uh, the peelers peel and the grating that right there is where I really saw the art and the science of how it worked as a commerce. I know that we would uh, head the shrimp and then the shrimp would then go to be graded, put into sizes. And those sizes, that was, uh, that was you know, you knew how you were selling a large shrimp or the application if it was going to be a small or a large if it was going to be peeled down the road. Uh, but we learned a lot. We learned a lot watching our dad at work. Um, and again, today, I draw on so many of those examples that help me today get through what we're, my brother and I are doing in our business today. With the retail end of it, Matthews and, and uh, Ambos and the Cesaronis too, uh, 
There's so many people that had the little fish markets, but they helped feed Savannah. Even the, the people who uh, would come to us and have carts, and they would hawk vegetables, and they would hawk uh, oysters and crab and, and fish in these large wheel carts going up and down the street. But you could always get the best fish from one of the Italian dealers. I hate to say it, but the, the, the Italians really specialized. They took such pride in the quality of their product. Uh, during the Depression, we still, you know, people have to eat. There was still a lot of money flowing, and the banks would come and bid on the cash that would show up in our ships. Of course, it wasn't well known at the time. You know, it was fairly secretive. But the banks had no money, so we gave them an influx of cash to have on hand. So the banks in Savannah didn't fail at nearly the rate that they did in other parts of the country. You know, we still had cash. We were an agrarian society. So we had, you know, the only thing we really didn't have was gasoline and rubber. And, you know, we always had plenty to eat. There was seafood everywhere. And it was pr it proliferated in, in the local waters. We have to look a little harder now than we did back in those days. Uh, but we had all the farm products we needed, and the meat and everything else, because we had all these farms. We were. We were fairly well untouched by the depression. You know, there was there was a lot of people out of work. You know, that's for sure. But the people didn't starve like they did. There were soup kitchens still, but not as many. We had food brokers, and these people, with their network or their sales network, were able to uh, spread our products under 150 different labels all over the United States. And we were such large canners that people. Uh, who wanted their own brands would have their own brands and we would pack for, well, we even packed grapefruit. But in 68, there weren't any crabs because the federal government gave um, the state of Georgia $3 million to eradicate the fire ant by airplane. And I was fishing one day with a friend and we were out in Adams Creek and watched the airplane go over one of those hammocks and you could see the granules. It was kind of like rain coming out of a cloud below the plane. And I watched that plane just go over the island and then continue to drop that bait all the way across the marsh until it ran out. And um, so that told me, uh, you know, they were doing this absolutely wrong. And that was 67, 68 is when I started, and we couldn't catch a dozen live crabs out of 40 wooden crab traps in a day. <laughs> it was awful, and the ones we did catch were so weak and sick, they couldn't even pinch me hard enough to hold their weight up. Mr. Vaughn, I was talking to him one day, and he said, well, Charlie said, we're only gonna be doing this for two more years, and I said, you know, well, what about his, your son, Algie? He said, well, He's still gonna be here, but the government has come in and they want us to change our operation from boiling into a steaming, okay? He told me at the time it was like to a half a million dollars to get steaming operation, redo the plant they wanted and all. And he said, you know, I'm, I'm old now. I don't remember how old he was at the time, but he said two more years and I'm, I'm getting out of the crabbing part. So this was a government thing that rather than work with him, your grandfather in, you boon all this. Okay, I could even see if he came in and say, all right, now Mr. Vaughn, we've checked your crab meat. It's not up to par. Now what you need to do, and you know, but the bacteria from steaming, from somebody who graduated from University of Georgia thing, and he, he's in uh, Atlanta, he's making this rule to affect us and the people in Savannah. And so that industry was shut down. And they've made a monument or a, a museum out of it now that you can go out there and tour. But that, I mean, that, that's over with. But throughout the years, you know, the crabbing and the oyster industry, you know, it's, it's changed um, a great deal because, you know, the early fishermen, you know, like my uncle, them that I remember, they only harvest oysters during like the winter months and they harvest the crabs during the summer and the spring. They let the crabs um, proliferate during the, the winter months and same with the oysters, you know, you know, they didn't harvest after a certain period of time. In 1980, my brothers and my father and I 
uh, bought out his brother, Gilbert Magioni, and we had taken over the operating assets when he had taken over the cash and some of the real estate. And so we ran the cannery. Uh, you know, I had cooked as much as 15,000 bushels of oysters every week when the tide was right and the weather was good. So that's, people ask me to go, you want to go to an oyster roast? And well, no thanks. <laughs> I could smell those in my nightmares, you know. <laughs> but, you know, you work 90 hours a week and you smell nothing but oysters. But, you know, talk about being a hero. I'd go over to the oyster washer and get a couple of shrimp baskets full of oysters and bring them home. They were spotless clean, all broken up into singles and people would be standing there with the fire ready, you know, let's, let's cook. Jeffrey, my nephew, is uh, operating. We, uh, we were founded in 1870, and the company has been owned and operated by family ever since 1870, so we're proud of that fact. And uh, we're most proud of Jeffrey and, and the great work that he's doing. Uh, he, I know he's making his dad proud. I took over the business when my father got sick in uh, 2015. And so this is my fifth season of owning, of uh, running the business. And uh, coming behind my father has been pretty amazing. If you see something like duct tape or tied together, I look at Roland and we both laugh. He said, that's your daddy. <laughs> you, know, you know, Jerry rigged together the whole plant. But, um, but when I took over, um, he taught me as much as he could teach me in a short time and uh, so I, this is my fifth season and I really love being in the seafood business. It's volatile, uh, lots of you know fluctuations, lots of variables like mother nature uh, and then your basic fundamental uh, small business type problems. Um, but it's a, it's a great business and I really love it. I love the challenge and I love the people in it. Um, and I love being outdoors now. I never thought I'd have a job or a business where, you know, I got to be outdoors. Uh, it means a lot. Down here, we're blessed in Georgia and South Carolina uh, with having too many oysters. You know, you need to break up the oyster rocks in order for them to grow because they're so prolific in these waters. Now, in the early days, these fishermen, they didn't harvest oysters except for during the winter months. And um, during the uh, off season, the fishermen, they had a process they called reseeding or replanting the oyster shell. See, after the oyster was extracted, they took this oyster shell back to the oyster bed and they replanted or reseeded. And the reason for that is this oyster produced up to 100 million eggs per season. And the perfect place for that baby oyster or the spat to lodge or land is on existing oyster shell. So here's some bamboo. I've done it uh, three or four years ago. See the oyster spat, the, the, the barnacle attaches to the bamboo, and then the oyster attaches to the barnacle. That beautiful oyster right there. You're looking for that. You pull that up. All this stuff underneath. You wanna leave it there to replant. Just a little bit. Replant it there. Replant it there. There's a lot. There's a lot of different seafoods that are uh, diminishing. Crab shrimp, fish, everything's just diminishing, just over, over getting overeaten, pollution, this and that. So a lot of people are finding that uh, getting into the oyster farming business is, is, a good, is a good thing, and it is. It's a sustainable business, and it purifies the water. They're bivalves, so they uh, keep the, the water cleaner. Through my years of crabbing in the summers, I just enjoyed it so much. I was, from the time my father first took me fishing when I was about four years old and I caught my first, first fish, I was hooked on the river. And 
Now, when I was about 10, he brought me my first little boat and a set of oars. It's just a different way of life that, that don't many people don't get the opportunity or don't have the interest in learning. And uh, I wouldn't trade it for anything in the world. We all worked together as a common cause. We got the job done and, and we didn't have any squabbles, any disagreements. Not that I, I never did. Um, it was always uh, just a joyful place to work. And we just did what we were supposed to do and interact with each other and it was always a lot of laughter and it was, it was great. That's something you hear people out there talk about is God a lot, you know, and I think their dependence on the river and nature and survival um, gave them a real closeness to God because when you're really down and out, that's the one person you know that's always there listening. Baptism, if you were a Gullah Geechee, when you become a member of the Baptist Church, you had to be baptized. You were submerged in the salt water, not just any type of water, but it was salt water. And um, you went through a period of seeking, which was sort of like a um, period of rites of passage. But um, uh, on the day of the baptism, you would be ducked in the salt water. The preacher would raise you back up. And what that represents is the idea of uh, your sins being washed away and carried away to sea. And when we talk about the Gullah Geechee people, we're talking about uh, the descendants of those Africans that were brought from West Africa directly to Georgia in the Carolinas to cultivate rice. My dad would take us out on a shrimp boat, fishing actually, right off of Tybee. And uh, he would take the whole family out. Uh, no captain, it was just him at the helm, and, um, and the three boys and my mom. She, we would pack a lunch and we would head out to uh, right off of Tybee, and uh, we would just shrimp for three, four, five hours. And um, he would drop the nets, and he expl would explain to us, you know, how far you have to be off the beach to, to legally catch shrimp, and um, would show us how to maneuver around the different markers and buoys and what each color meant and so forth. So at a young age, we, we would do this every summer. And um, we would learn about head-on shrimp, um, how to hold a shrimp, how to head a shrimp, uh, the different sizes, the counts, um, what all this equipment is on, the, on, on a shrimp boat, how it, um, how it works, you know, um, how it's evolved since he was a, a kid growing up on a boat. But um, it really, it really uh, made me respect and understand what all a shrimper goes through on a daily basis and how hard, hard of work it is. Um, these guys work really hard out here. You know, as a kid going down to Thunderbolt, it was a blank canvas. I mean, there was just um, so much to learn, so much to see. We, we just had some of the best days of our life as brothers. As brothers, we just did it all together. I mean, we beat up on each other down there. We learned how to fish down there. Back then, fishing was not as popular as it is today with the younger generation, which we're so glad to see. Back then, when we were fishing, I mean, I didn't have many friends that wanted to go fish. <laughs> so, I mean, they were like, man, I'm going to the golf course. But we'd go fish. to the cooler here. So here's some of our bushels. 40 pounds. Real nice plugs on there. And here's our St. Helena salts. These are our single blade oysters here. And then we have our Roddy Rocks down here. 
which is our cup-shaped single oysters. Blades, cups. The canning business eventually went away and my father picked up the name Majoni and created Majoni Seafood after the canning business shut down, I believe in 1990. And he took a lot of the components, which I'll show you later. We have a conveyor system that came from that factory, which is my father's uh, kind of invention to uh, wash oysters. They used to be used, the conveyors were once used at the processing facility where they steamed them. But he, he brought it all back over here to the factory and set it up. And so now we have a washing, a bushel business. He transformed it from a canning business down to basically a bushel business and clams. Today at Ambo Seafoods, one component that we don't have that I think every generation before us has had is boat ownership. And there are many days that we wish we were in the boat ownership business. But there are days where we are so glad we're not in boat ownership. I've got that experience and I've got a father that can guide me and tell us, you know, here, this is the real picture of what it looks like. And it's a tough business. And I know that um, there are days that um, you can't fish because of Mother Nature. There are days that uh, the, the boat needs maintenance. There are days that, that are just, sometimes are bad days. And, um, and those bad days take us out of, of who we really are and what we do. And what we really try to do is bring the best products we can to the consumer. Talking about my dad and some of the things that we've learned from him, he had a saying that we use in our uh, business model today. It's a simple one and it's basically fix today's problems today because tomorrow brings a whole nother set. And if you live by that model, um, man, I tell you what, you can get a lot done. With us all being married now, we all got the family, we got all the families together, and of course we're married with kids, so we took our little ones out with us, and they got to experience what we experienced growing up, and what my dad experienced while he was growing up. And um, it's a neat little tradition that we kind of got back into. And I know in our business, we're very engaged with it. We're very active. We're not, you know, we, we say this all the time because we're avid football fans, but we, we work, we coach from the sideline, not from the skybox. We want to be down there with our workers. We want to be in the trenches with our co-workers. We feel that we share in it together. We share the good and the bad, and we help each other. We teach each other. We love on each other, and we make it a better place. And we feel like by doing that, that's going to give us the recipe for success because our, our, our employees realize, hey, this is a team approach. It's not an owner and then a group. The owners are right here with us. We're all doing this together. What's that I smell, baby? There's fish sent all around. Yeah, what's that I smell, baby? That fish scent is all around. Every time I come in, baby, fish, fish scent all around. In 2005, uh, my husband and his partners decided to open another restaurant. Uh, there were already four or five restaurants that they had, but they decided to branch out onto the south side of town and do a seafood restaurant. And as we were in the process of building the restaurant, I was leaving the site um, and heading home one day. And as I was going down Victory Drive, I was passing a billboard that said, you didn't come to Savannah to eat palm raised shrimp from China. And a light bulb kind of went off. I'm born and raised here. Uh, there has always been fresh seafood plentiful in Savannah. 
And I thought, no, you, you, you didn't. It was always here. And at the time, there's a, there's a plentiful supply of seafood, local seafood in Savannah, but it takes an incredible amount of hard work and energy to harvest it and raise it and make it available to us as restaurateurs to, to uh, provide it to the public. Our philosophy in the restaurant business all along for all these years has, to, has been to get the best quality product you can get, the freshest product that you can get, and charge what you have to charge, but get the best you can get. And that means fresh local shrimp, flounder, crabs that you can get. And it's, it's difficult to find, but these, these families, the Majonis and the Barnes and the Ambos, families and all have worked their entire lives to to make that product available and it, it makes Savannah and the community proud. You still have two family members, um, the Ambos and the Majonis, that are still operating today, which is amazing. For the Majonis it's been, this year was it will be 150 years that their family's been in operation. And the Ambos, I'm not sure, it's it's up there as well. I'd love to see the, the industry come back, you know. I'm grateful that um, a foundation came in and preserved Pinpoint. Would have loved to have seen some of these families' businesses preserved. It was just an inspiration as we were going through these things and looking into the boxes and looking through all the photographs. You got inspired. You got, you got moved by the dedication and the hard work that people like Algie Varn um, just put into, into the work because they loved it. What I hope you've, you take away from watching this video is an appreciation for what these families and others did for the Savannah community and the thousands that they employed, people that took pride in what they were doing and loved what they were doing. A lot of hard work and so many of us have benefited from that.